Hey, what's up you guys? It's Dorothy and welcome back to my channel. In today's video, we're going to go into chapter 11 of How to Disappear by Sharon Huss Wrote. Um, we are getting into some juicy good bits of this book. So let's keep on reading to find out what is going to happen next. This video may contain sensitive topics and foul language. If you do not wish to continue, please click off for the video now. You have been warned. Chapter 11. I slouched low on the bus ride home, knees pressed to the seat in front of me, eyes level with the bottom of the window. The urge to text Jenna is strong, an ache almost. I check her Instagram instead. It doesn't make the ache go away, just shifts it from my chest to my stomach. New selfies with Tristan pop up on the screen, laughing, smiling, kissing. I'm so sorry for the noise. Her hair is perfect, her makeup is perfect, her eyes are even lined. Since when does she wear eyeliner? I clicked back to Vicarious. She's up to 4,121 followers. The Where's Waldo post has 237 likes. I scroll them, look for Marvo. If he's following, then I'll know where he got the whole naked Where's Waldo idea. There's no Marvelicious, but plenty of other interesting names. One girl, Invisible Lemmy, posts selfies where she crops most of herself out of the photo. She shows only her shoulder or part of her face or her hand. She adds the hashtag see me tag. To ev on everything but she also uses hashtag don't see me and hashtag ignored and hashtag lonely and hashtag talk to me and hashtag don't talk to me I know exactly how she feels I tap on the hashtags to see who else feels the same way some of the posts are kind of disturbing nude photos and spam level weird which isn't supposed to be allowed on Instagram but I guess their porn checkers are too busy to catch it all I skip around them and what's left are people just sharing their pain hoping there that somebody anybody is paying attention I cringe at the pictures of cut marks of blood dripping down pale arms or thighs slashed and raw of two thin bodies and mascara stained cheeks people are liking their photos which feel wrong is that what they want positive reinforcement of their suffering or maybe it's just the, the acknowledgement to be seen they expose their deepest pain for a handful of little red hearts i feel almost guilty that my silly posts are getting so much attention while the people who desperately need it receive so little it's not fair that followers flock the vicarious and flee those who are hurting but i understand it joy attracts and misery repeals isn't that why Jenna prefers her new friends over me? Heck, that's why I prefer Vicarious over myself. Aside from the first post, Vicarious is never alone. She's fun, fearless, energetic, happy. She's everything that I am not. She's an escape from the misery, but it's not enough. They need somebody to care about them, to do more than like their pain. I want to wave my arms at Instagram and say, hey, can't you see? Over there, they need you. Maybe that's what we're all doing, waiting for someone else to step in. Like there's a magical Instagram fairy who will appear out of nowhere and make it all better. Then it strikes me, maybe I'm the magical Instagram fairy. I let the idea settle for a few minutes, my brain wrapping around it curls of smoke from a pipe. Can I do that? Can I be that person? I don't know, so I flip the question, can I not do that? Can I just look away? The answer is, I can't. So I take a deep breath and start clicking in comment windows of these people who are suffering. I write, I care. I see you. I'm here for you. I understand. You are not alone. I do it all the way home on the bus, on their pages, not mine. My follower number ticks up and up anyway. I want to tell them you don't have to follow me. It makes me feel dirty somehow that there's a reward attached to caring, but I can't ignore them. Some start asking me to follow back. I guess that's how they measure their worth. Is that how we all measure our worth now? There are too many though, and I don't want to follow anyone if I can't follow everyone. I don't want any of them to feel left out or overlooked or not good enough. If they leave a comment though, I reply. I give them hearts and smileys. It's not enough, but it's something. I continue after dinner and late into the night. By curious adds a thousand followers. One in three is hashtag alone or hashtag ignored or hashtag depressed. I try to reach out to all of them, but their numbers keep growing and I can't keep up. I pay for the effort on Wednesday morning, nearly falling asleep in world history. Lipton whispers to me a couple of times, alerting me to the page number we're supposed to be on, or that Mr. Braxley has told us to write something down. He smiles, and I want to smile back, but it's taking all of my energy to stay awake and balance the extra weight of hashtag loneliness I'm carrying today. The bell rings and I start to gather my stuff. Lipton says, wait, I uh, wanted to ask you. He pauses, swallows, just a second. He, start digs, he starts digging around in his backpack and I wonder if he's got another page of Seas of Jerusalem notes, which is nice of him except I should probably do my own research. He glances at me, up at me nervously and keeps searching. Finally, he produces a small bag of peanut M&Ms. He holds it out to me. Do you want these? Mr. Patton gave them to everyone in English, but I'm allergic to peanuts, so 
I stare at the yellow bag of m ms It's kind of random and a little weird, but he's standing there hopeful, smiling. Uh, unless you're allergic to, the smile drops from his face and starts to draw his hand away. Suddenly, I want those peanut m ms more than anything else in the world. I want to smile back on the... I want the smile back on Lipton's face. I thrush my hand out. I'm not allergic. Great. He presses the bag into my palm. He returns. I realize I haven't said thank you after he walks away, and then I feel bad about it. But mostly, I feel tired. Miss Green's office door is open again when I walk past, but I keep going, wishing with every step I take that I had the nerve to go in just to rest. She said I could. I could eat my M&Ms in there instead of the bathroom. I could share them with her, and we wouldn't have to talk at all. Just sit in her comfy chairs under her twinkly lights and eat Lipton's peanut M&Ms in the quiet. I surprised myself by pivoting to walk back toward her office, but someone has beaten me to it. The door is closing, and through the opening I see her slender legs, her perfect bun. Hallie Bryce isn't gliding for once. She slumps into the comfy chair, head sagging to her chest. Miss Green slip, slips a do not disturb sign over the doorknob and pulls it shut. I stare at the closed door. Why would Hallie Bryce possibly need to talk to Miss Green? For the rest of the day, it's all I can think about. I look for Hallie in the hall and classes we share. When I spot her, she's a tall... She's as tall and poised, as confident as ever, not showing the slightest sign of distress and obvious to the jealous murmurings of classmates like Mallory and her friend from the bathroom, but always alone. I've never noticed that before. I end up saving the M&Ms to eat on the bus ride home, and when I finish them, I press the empty raptor flat so I can save it. I don't know why, maybe to make sure I didn't imagine that Lipton really did give me his peanut M&Ms. Sometimes vicarious feels more real than my real life, and it's good to know my existence, Vicky, that is, has not gone unnoticed. When I get home, my mother is waiting for me in the driveway. I tuck my M&M wrapper into my pocket as I approach the car. She rolls down the window. Are you going somewhere, I ask? Hair salon, she says. Are you coming with me? I made you an appointment. I groan and get in the car. There is no use arguing. This is a torment my mother inflicts upon me every few months, usually coinciding with occasions like Mar- coinciding with occasions like Marissa's party that she deems momentous enough for additional grooming. It definitely belongs on the list, having to sit in a chair and be subjected to random questions by a complete stranger who also happens to be wielding a pair of scissors. It's not my idea of a good time. Mom hands me a smile pallial of ta- torn magazine pages. Their hairstyles, I thought you might like to try something new. Translation, she'd really like me to try something new. I flip through the pictures of gorgeous models and celebrities in their fabulous hair, short wavy bobs, and flowy trundles of pixie cuts. Have you met me, I say? She gives me a side eye. Yes, and I think you'd look great with one of those hairstyles, because I look terrible the way I am. I didn't say that. You implied it. She sighs. I just think you'd be happier with a hairstyle that doesn't weigh you down so much. We arrive at the salon and go inside. I follow behind her because walking into any place where you're expected to answer questions about your intentions upon arrival always stresses me out. Mom is happy to speak for me, though, so I let her do her thing. It's not until I'm in the chair with a red cape tied around my neck and my mother sitting in the waiting area that I tell my stylist, Rachel, just to trim, please. An inch? Two inches? I was thinking more like a quarter inch. She smiles. You won't even be able to tell. I nod. Perfect. Rachel leads me to the sink for a wash and then sets about trimming. I won't try to make you look at like someone else, she says. That's what people want sometimes, but they're never happy with how it turns out. I mumble, thanks, and she gets to work. She doesn't talk in- incessantly or ask me questions about school. She just trims, and when she's done, she turn- runs her fingers through the thickness of it. I could thin it out a bit if you'd like. Nobody but you will notice the difference. It won't be so heavy. I consider this for a minute and say okay. She takes out a different pair of scissors and cuts some more, and afterward my head does feel lighter, like the fabric that frames my face has changed from quartery to chiffon. She dries it and styles it the way that I normally do, then holds a mirror so I can see the back. I hardly ever look at the back of my head, and I'm surprised at how much it resembles Hallie Bryce's hair when she's not wearing a bun. I tilt my head to the left and the right. My hair sways softly, just like Hallie's does. Everything okay, Rachel says? I don't like... I don't tell her she did make me look like someone else because it's too late to stop her. I press my lips tight, nod my approval, even though I'm not sure I approve. She removes the cape. All the extra hair falls to the floor. Then she gestures toward my hands, clasped in my lap. You want me to throw that away? You look down. I look down and see the yellow m M&M m wrapper pressed between my fingers like I'm clinging it for dear life. I haven't even realized I was holding it. No, I say quickly, shoving it back in my pocket. That's okay. I hold my breath as I walk out of the out to the waiting area, stealing myself 
for the fuss of my mother will make about how different I look. She doesn't, though. Makes a fuss. She rolls her eyes when she sees me, passes the bill, and gives Rachel a tip. I, it's not even when we're walking back to the car when she says, I'm so glad I paid $40 for you to look exactly the same as we as when we walked in. I gave it her, what? Did she even cut it, or was that it? A very expensive wash and blow dry. She cut a ton, I say. Mom snorts, shakes her head. We got into the car and I flipped down the visor to look at the mirror. It's completely different, but maybe Rachel was true to her word and nobody will notice the difference except me. I'm a little worried the Eminem wrapper is going to turn into some kind of security blanket because I pull it out again on the bus the next morning and hold it in my palm all the way to school. I'm nervous walking the halls with a new haircut, but quickly realize that nobody's looking at my hair. Nobody sees me at all. I shove my coat into my locker as the warning bell rings and hurry to class. Mr. Braxley is already standing in front of the room and the bell rings a few seconds later. I sit and try to call my breathing. Okay, people, he says, you should have pretty well, be pretty well into your pro research by now. But if anyone has questions or issues with the project or with their group or their lack of a group, see me after class. He looks straight at me. Everyone turns to stare. Okay, maybe not everyone, but Lipton's gaze is practically searing a hole through the side of my head. I can feel it. I glance over. He beams at me with a thousand watt smile. Your hair looks really nice today, he says. I blink at him. He has the warmest eyes, and his smile is really wide, and there's an adorable gap between his two front teeth. But I, what I really like about him is that he sees me even when I'm invisible. Tingles shoot all the way through, all the way from my toes to my fingertips and kneecaps and elbows straight to my chest. My heart starts pounding like I've just sprinted a marathon. So, of course, I act like he's got a contagious skin condition and say nothing. Did you get it cut, he asks. I shake my head, eyes bulging. Huh. Looks different, he shrugs, and beams at me again. Last chance to join Team Thermopylae. Adam and I are meeting at my house Saturday if you want to join us. I, um, can't, I say. His smile drops. Oh, well. Mr. Braxley starts teaching, and I focus on taking notes. My hair falls gently over my shoulders every time I lean forward. Not the stiff curtain it usually is. I still can hide behind it, but I don't. I tuck it behind my ear so I can see Lipton in my peripheral vision. I'm pretty sure he's watching me, too, and it feels good to be seen. I wonder if this is how all those people on Instagram feel when they write hashtag see me and someone finally does. That is the end of chapter 11. I will see you guys in the next video. Bye!